React on the server is not PHP. As soon as I was linked to this one, I knew I had to cover it. We always talk about how React is just PHP now, or PHP did it right and we're copying it from there and all these things with the new server component stuff. And while there is a lot of really interesting things that React is learning or copying however you want to frame it from the PHP world, there's a lot of things it does very differently. And it's important to acknowledge both as we have these conversations. Are server components going back in time some amount? Yes. Are they a meaningful advancement on how we used to do things that learned lessons from how we do them now? Also, yes. This seems really exciting, and I hope this article goes into all these details. Before we can read it, quick word from today's sponsor. Notice what's on my shirt? I'd heard it before, Panstack. It's the way you should probably be fetching data in your React apps. If you're not, go fix that. When you're back, you might want to know where you get that data from. Obviously, if you already have a backend, cool, good for you. But for those who don't, Convex is here to solve all your problems. If you're not already familiar, Convex is the only decision you need to make for your backend. Everything from file storage to auth to your data database, and most importantly, live sync. You might think it's going to be complex, but I want to show you how simple the code is. This is an actual chat interface that you can go generate using their CLI, and it's very simple. Here's all of the logic. We have use query, API messages list, use mutation, API messages send, and then a handle submit when you hit the submit button. And if we take a quick look at this, What's good? Immediately appears in both tabs. Whoa, what? There's no custom sync code, no setting up WebSockets, none of that? Nope. When you're ready to set up the data, all you have to do, if you want to see where this comes from, you can just command click. And here is the backend query that you wrote. You write the backend code in a convex folder in your code base. They deploy it. They handle the database. They handle everything. And the code can be really simple, like this. We're just grabbing the most recent 100 messages, or we're creating a new message. If you've used TRPC, this might look familiar, you know? Yeah, it's like TRPC, but for your whole backend, already built for you, really exciting stuff. If you haven't tried it already, go give them a shot today. Tell them Theo sent you, soydev.link slash convex. Is server-side JavaScript just PHP all over again? Not so fast. Dive into the evolution of web development from PHP to modern full stack JS frameworks. Discover why it isn't a step backwards, but a leap forward in building powerful and efficient web applications. Today, I wanted to talk about a topic that's been buzzing around Twitter and dev circles lately. You've probably heard people say, now that we're server-side rendering JS, it's just PHP all over again. Well, buckle up, because I'm about to explain why that's not quite the case and why it's actually pretty darn exciting. Remember when Internet Explorer was still a thing? I know, I'm aging myself. I, most of us probably remember IE, I would hope. We're, we're young, but we're not, we're not that young. We were all writing PHP to our heart's content, and life seemed simpler. But here's the twist. We weren't building complex, ambitious apps that we are today. We were solving smaller problems, and that's what people often miss when they get nostalgic. Oh, I'm gonna fucking love this article. Okay, okay. I am so happy they said this, and they put it this clearly. Because when I say this, people get mad at me. But it is correct. The things we build today are significantly more complex than the bulletin boards we were posting on in the 90s and early 2000s. And to pretend that things were easier because the tools were better is to fundamentally miss the fact that the things we're building are more complex. Are there more websites that are static than there are really dynamic on the web? Absolutely. But the devs that are working on these things every day, the majority of devs who are being paid full-time salaries are working on things that are more complex than a static blog from the early 2000s. So the people who are working, getting jobs, and spending their time and money on these things are using these modern tools so much because they make their lives so much easier. And these big companies that employ thousands of people aren't building basic CRUD apps that PHP handled well a lot of the time. Sometimes they are, and it's valuable for these tools to exist, especially for things like internal dashboards and whatnot. Huge for all of that stuff. But these complex dynamic apps are a very different use case but that doesn't mean we can't benefit from things on the server too. And finding the balance is really important. But in order to find the balance, we have to acknowledge that today's problems are often harder than what the previous technologies were built to solve. If you need proof of that, watch my video where I tear apart the hey.com calendar, the Rails one, because it was, oh God, it was so bad. Great example of how old tech doesn't solve these problems well. I will say before we go further, Laravel is a huge exception here because they have things like inertia deeply baked in, so you can use the best parts of client-side JavaScript and the server-side PHP ecosystem to bridge the gap meaningfully. But the gap exists, they're just building bridges over it. And server components are another type of bridge here. 
Somebody in chat just said that they started working in a 15-year-old Rails code base recently, and they're really missing modern tools. As someone who's playing with Rails a lot the last few days, it's bad. It's actually insane. Anyways, back in the day, we'd use server-side languages like PHP or Java, or if you were really living on the edge, Perl. We'd follow the MVC model, popularized by frameworks like Rails or CodeIgniter. Our controllers would fetch data from the database, pass it to a view, and voila, you had rendered a page. I will say it's not quite that simple. When you call the like generator function in Rails to make a new model or add changes, literally saw it add like 15 files for one model creation, which is insane. <laughs> but yeah. When you visited a URL, you'd get a bunch of HTML, the browser would render it, and everything was hunky-dory. What about interactivity? Well, that's where JavaScript came into play. We'd use it to enhance the existing elements rendered on the server. Remember unobtrusive JavaScript? It was all about making the UI work with native browser primitives and then sprinkle some JS magic in on top. Looking back, I think it might have been an excuse to avoid writing too much JS. And honestly, who could blame us? Especially then JS was garbage. My experience with early JS was a bit of a mixed bag. jQuery made it easy to add functionality, but the language, much like PHP, wasn't pleasant to work with. Before ES6, it was pretty terrible to work with. Raise your hand if you remember var self2 equals the... Oh, God. That, that just... That, that aged me. That Comment if that hurt you as much as it hurt me, because I'm in pain. And don't even get me started on browser compatibility. We tried our best to write as little JS as possible, using it in places where it was absolutely necessary. But here's the thing. We wanted to build more stuff, more impressive apps. We need better functions for our users. And as our apps got more and more ambitious, we couldn't escape JS. It's the language of the web, after all. As we built larger and more complex apps in the browser, we started running into some serious headaches. For starters, creating your UI on the server and then editing it at runtime with JS was like trying to pat your head and rub your belly simultaneously. Possible, but not exactly graceful. Especially if sometimes when you're patting your head and rubbing your belly, one of those things disappears magically for no reason. Like imagine you're just patting your head and then your head goes undefined or your stomach goes nan. Reality, man. Imagine having a blog post like this one with a comment system. You would loop over all the comments in your template and create the HTML structure on the server. What happens when the user posts a new comment? You need to create a DOM element in the browser. You'd either have to recreate the comment structure with the same tags and classes in JS. Hello, maintenance nightmare. Yeah, this is hellish. I've seen this so often where you're recreating the server like layout on the client and hoping it all works. And then you miss one CSS class or you don't define the HTML structure just right, and it all falls apart. The other solution is you would create a hidden template element and clone it and populate the right divs with the correct data, and hopefully no one's changed the class name in the template. It was not ideal, to say the absolute least. Yeah, this, if you haven't dealt with this hell, then you better not talk shit about modern JavaScript because you don't know how bad it was and how much better these things are. Like, do not talk shit on React until you understand how bad things were before. We also realized that using imperative code for building UIs was as fun as trying to herd cats. Herding cats can be fun, to be fair. It's a lot of work and not particularly viable, but running around with a bunch of cats is fun. We wanted our UIs to be declarative and based on state. We wanted reusable components. That way, we could always render the UI correctly without worrying about things getting out of sync. So we moved everything to the client. Single page applications became all the rage, and we had rich interactivity at our fingertips. It was amazing until it wasn't. We can now build amazing UIs and user experiences, but that came with a new set of challenges. First off, we had to reinvent navigation. No more go to a URL, HTML returns. Now we need to have routing frameworks to handle page loads and transitions. We gained superpowers with this, like keeping state between pages, but with great power comes great responsibility. I've lost count of how many links I've seen in SPAs that are just buttons with click handlers. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame JavaScript to React for that. I blame people for being dumb, but it does suck that there's so many buttons that are being used as links nowadays. Now we're loading our data from our API so we can show and modify data with ease. We have to figure out how to deal with loading states and waterfalls. Then came the performance. When your entire app lives on the client, it's now up to your device to create the whole UI. It's not exactly speedy. And having the server render an empty div and a script tag for each page isn't great for SEO either. I've talked about this so much, I don't want to like beat it in more. But when I was at Twitch, we had to build a separate service to on a cron regenerate the HTML 
for every person's stream page so that we could have the right metadata when you shared it on social media and when you indexed it on Google because the whole app was rendered with JavaScript. So you'd have a separate Go service just trying to embed the right metadata in the HTML and it was usually out of date because it would cache it so long and then update it on a cron. The fact that we had to invent our own service just to make sure the right metadata existed in the HTML is horrifying. And Next.js was invented to solve those types of problems. However, perhaps the biggest drawback was how it solidified the divide between front-end and back-end developers. Ooh, hot take that I absolutely agree with. SPAs drew a hard line between these two and people became less flexible. And now with server components and the new Next.js stuff, they're being asked to bridge the gap again. And it's, people have been so used to it for so long now that they're uncomfortable with it. Back in the day, we were all just web developers. Sure, you might've preferred centering divs to writing database queries, but working across the stack was common. This division created communication barriers and I believe led to worse products overall. After all, how can you create a unified experience when your teams are not unified? Absolutely fucking agree with this. I've, this is part of why I push the full stack way of building as hard as I do. It shouldn't be hard to hop between these things and to do the right thing for what you're trying to build. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have specialties. It doesn't mean every JS dev needs to be a SQL expert. It means you should know how your applications work well enough from back to front to meaningfully improve them for your users. It's actually a really cute little graphic. I love the art in this. Huge shout out to Christopher for writing this and making this so good. This is one of my favorite blog posts I've read this year. I'm loving this. Now here's where it gets exciting. We're not going back to PHP. We're moving forward with full stack frameworks like Next, Remix, and SvelteKit, and Solid Start, and Tanstack Start. There's a lot of cool ones. These frameworks give us a unified stack with JS all the way. We can handle routing and data loading on the server. We can build our UIs using state-of-the-art declarative components and create amazing user experiences using the best of both worlds. I know what you're thinking. Aren't server components with SQL queries just like the old PHP code we all hated? What happened to the separation of concerns? Well, not quite. Sure, at first glance, it might look like the crazy PHP code where we would mix SQL, HTML, and CSS, stick it to index PHP, and call it a day. But here's the difference. We've developed solid principles for building UIs, and now we have a unified language and toolkit to create great user experiences, utilizing both what the server is good at and what the browser excels at. Really like this framing here. The fact that the pieces can be reused, where you can have a component that is rendered exactly the same on the client and the server, the server can trigger updates, the client can fetch new data to update itself, that you can write the same syntax for the server code and the client code and bridge and meld them together in this way is very different from PHP, where you would have to defer to jQuery and clone templates to do client-side updates. The fact that the client and the server code are written with the same primitives and can be shared and interrupted in such a powerful way makes this a fundamentally different, better way of building. We're not going backward. We're taking all the lessons we've learned and created something even better. It's like we've taken the best parts of our PHP days and supercharged them with everything we love about modern JS. We can now build really ambitious applications and frameworks like Next and Remix allow us to utilize the server for more than just serializing JSON. It's sad to think that the average network request nowadays is turning, returning JSON, not HTML, but it almost certainly is. And these tools allow us to, to do more, which is really exciting. Speaking of exciting, here's where it gets really exciting. These full stack JS frameworks are helping us close the gap between front-end and back-end devs. I will give the spicy additional take of, this is part of why people are getting really frustrated right now. There's a lot of devs who liked the fact that they could fully live on front-end and never think about servers anymore. A lot of the bigger JavaScript side GraphQL advocates loved it because they put a huge wall between them and the back-end, so they no longer had to think about the server. And I think a lot of the pushback came from really influential people who were influential because they were really deep on this thing, which was front end dev. The spicy way of putting this is the people who we looked up to and listened to for good advice on front end best practices, the influencers who were leading the charge on education around React, those people were the ones who were the most excited about it. And the ones who are the most excited about it are inherently the ones who are the most likely to go all in on front end and ignore back end. Now that React is saying, wait, you should know a bit more about back end, those devs feel betrayed because React allowed them to go all in on the front end side and stop thinking about the back end. And they became influential because of their focus in on front end stuff. And that's why we saw many influential people saying that they felt left behind by React. It's because they fell behind because they were so obsessed with front end, they stopped paying attention to back end at all. 
And that's why it's hard for me to sympathize with those people because as much as I looked up to them, I cared more about building the right thing for the user than I did about how my JS runs in the browser. And even though those people know way more about CSS and browser performance optimization shit, their inability to comprehend what a server is and how it works means they are a much worse overall developer than the types of people who are hanging out here. And that breaks my heart because those people should be able to level up and should be really excited for the opportunity to do more backend and bridge this gap. But they like the gap. They don't want it to go away. And they're mad they're being challenged to bridge this gap. And they are upset that people like me are showing up who hate the gap and are trying to bridge it ourselves and we're finding success. I honestly think a big reason why I am more popular than previous React influencers or whatever you want to call them is because I'm not just a React Andy in the browser. I'm trying to build great things and talk about all of the parts. And that is the future. The future isn't somebody specializing in performance threads in the browser. The future is people who can build real solutions to real problems. But that's also why this pushback got so visible at the time, because a lot of the last generation of React influencers felt betrayed that they had to learn about servers again. And I love Christopher for pointing out how big this gap was and how this is being bridged. So I can go on this tangent about why the sentiment was so bad. Anyways, remember that artificial divide that we created? Well, it's starting to crumble and that's a good thing. Depends on who you ask, but absolutely that's a good thing. With a unified language and tool set, it's becoming easier for a single dev to build an end-to-end -end feature. No more awkward handoffs between teams or lost in translation moments. You can now handle everything from the DB query to UI interactions in one seamless flow. It's like being a web dev superhero with powers on both sides of the stack. I don't just think it's going to make dev more efficient. I think it's going to lead to more cohesive products. After all, when you understand both the server and the client side, you can make smarter decisions about where to put logic and how to optimize for performance. It's bringing us back to the OG full stack developer ideal, but with way cooler tools and without the spaghetti code nightmares of the past. So if you've been feeling pigeonholed as a front end or back end dev, now's your chance to break free and embrace the full spectrum of web development. It's a fantastic time to be in our field. If you haven't dove into modern JS frameworks yet, what are you waiting for? Today's the day. We've come a long way from nesting PHP and HTML, and while it might look similar on the surface, we're building on years of UI development principles and best practices. I love this call out here. An idea I've had for a video for a while now is, dev is getting better. We always see people complaining about how things are going backwards and it's getting worse and everything's getting harder all the time. As someone who's been coding for a while, when I go back and look at my old code bases and compare it to now, it's not just like, oh, I'm better at code. It's holy shit. The way I was building before was so miserable. It's hard to put into words. And now it's much, much more pleasant. And I don't think that gets enough credit. And I want to start pushing it. I think software is in one of the best states it's ever been. Despite all the AI tools, despite JS framework of the week, I think we're in a great place right now. And I love this article for calling that out too. I'll let him have the last word. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this. Have you made the switch to full stack JS? Are you still holding on to PHP for dear life? Please drop a comment below. Let's chat. I loved this. Give Chris a follow. Check out his blog. This is one of my favorite posts I've read this year. I'm not exaggerating at all. That was awesome. That thank you so much for writing that. Thank you all for sticking by. Let me know what you think. And until next time, peace nerds.